Hello and welcome back to the channel. Welcome to my home. Today I've got a few little things that I want to talk about, of course, to do with the royal family. And the first thing that I wanted to talk about, there's a few kind of rumours and whispers swirling around. Um, mainly, it's, it's okay, it's come from Jenny Bond um, about William and Catherine kind of closing off their minds to reconciliation with Harry and Meghan for the foreseeable future, uh, almost like they've come to the conclusion that they aren't going to get anywhere with any kind of reconciliation attempts. And of course, it, the gossip goes into that, you know, Kate is such a big support, uh, filling the gap that, that Harry's left as that support structure as a brother. Now, I mean, I would like to say, uh, Catherine, you know, William has known Catherine for such a long time. She has been his support structure for many, 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 for decades now. Um, and most certainly since they were married. So Harry was not the only support structure that William had in place. I think that Catherine, I've said it before, she is definitely almost like a power behind the scenes. She is very, very strong-willed. I think she's strong-minded, but quiet with it. I don't think she's particularly uh, forceful. I think her approach is quite muted. But I think when she does speak, it carries a little bit of weight. And I think that has been ever-increasing uh, with her role within the royal family. And now that she is Princess of Wales, I think that has her word has even more clout. Uh, and we know that uh, some of the things that she said when everything was going on with Harry and Meghan when they were leaving um, about reconciliation, you know, about um, recollections may vary, that is reportedly uh, came from Catherine. So I definitely think that she has been William's biggest support structure for the past couple of decades, ever since they've known each other at university. That said, uh, Harry and William share a bond like no other. Not only are they brothers, but they have been through the hardest of times together and experienced the same thing at the same time. Although in different ways, because obviously there was a bit of an age gap. Not much, just a couple of years um, between, of course, William and Harry. And just that different level of maturity, I think, affected how they both dealt with losing their mother at such an early age. I do, however, think that whether or not Jenny Bond has heard this from palace sources or not, I do, however, think that she's correct in the fact that it is um, a bit of a lost cause. I don't think Harry is going to kind of come round to any to, to being reasonable in the foreseeable future. And therefore, it is best to just kind of close off that in your mind, compartmentalise it, put it on a shelf and carry on with your life, which is what we have seen William and Catherine do uh, over the past couple of years. They've just got on with it. They haven't retaliated, um, you know, and that kind of um, recollections may vary, I think, very much still stands. So I thought I would deal with that. And then that brings me on to the next kind of um, point, and that is about Harry being a councillor of state. So he is one um, of seven councillors of state, and it is required by law that all of the councillors of state have a UK residency, a home in the UK. Now, I'm not entirely sure what they are classing and qualifying, what qualifies as a home. I would, my definition of a home in the UK is something that you personally, as an individual, are either renting um, or you own, or you have a permanent room or, you know, you, you have a permanency at somebody else's address. So, for example, um, if King Charles gave Harry and Meghan usage of a certain number of rooms or even a room at Windsor Castle, then that would qualify as a home if it was permanent. If it's just kind of visiting, then, you know, you're kind of visiting more like a hotel. You're checking in, then you're checking out. You've got, I don't particularly class that as being, as having a level of permanence. So, 
for me, it's either got to be you've got a permanent, you know, rooms somewhere that you're being allowed to stay, whether you're paying money or not, or you've bought somewhere or you're renting or leasing somewhere. Um, Harry at the moment has none of those. Obviously, with what happened with Frogmore Cottage, he's no longer residing there. He doesn't have a permanent set of rooms in any of the palaces uh, or Windsor Castle or any of the king's private homes. So, and he's not he's not leasing or renting anything else or he hasn't bought anywhere else. So he, he doesn't have a UK home at the moment. The press have been a little bit dramatic in saying that uh, he's homeless in the UK. Um, technically, yes. Now, of course, when he came over more recently, we had all the stories about maybe he asked for uh, permission to stay at Windsor Castle. He had no inclination um, or intention of going to Balmoral. I think I reported on this myself. What came back was that um, all the all of King Charles's staff and whatever had decamped to Balmoral. Now, yes, I do think that Charles would have preferred Harry to have gone up to Balmoral, in part to kind of face the music. <laughs> it would have been that kind of chance to have that frank and open conversation that Harry kind of has suggested that he wanted, but then given the opportunity to have that, he kind of turned down and said that he was too busy. People have already looked at kind of Harry's diary schedule and worked out that there could have been movement there to go up, stay a little while and, you know, have the, that frank and open conversations that Harry professes to want to have. Anyway, he declined uh, going to Balmoral or at least he did not go to Balmoral. Rooms were not made available at Windsor Castle or any other royal home. And I, I mean, I've been to Windsor Castle. It's a huge place and it is the largest inhabited castle, I think, in, in Europe, I think, uh, certainly in the UK. And I find it hard to believe that there wasn't even one single room <laughs> that Harry could have could have used. Um, so I do think that's rather telling. Now, of course, a lot of the accommodation is used up by staff because it is um, it is a lived in uh, working castle, not just by the royal family, but you know, so there, there will be lots of staff that live um, at the castle. So, and all of uh, King Charles's court, if you like, has not decamped to Balmoral. There was many that stay behind at all the different royal residences to keep them ticking over. So, I find it hard to believe that there wouldn't have been any vacancy anywhere. I mean, not least of all, if Harry had been on good terms with William and Catherine, Adelaide Cottage was vacant because William and Catherine were up in Scotland with Balmoral. So had there been um, a degree of cordialness amongst the brothers, then Harry could have even stayed at Adelaide Cottage whilst it was empty and vacant. Just saying... Uh, you know, sometimes we have to face the consequences of our own actions. So Harry has found himself without somewhere to stay. He stayed in a hotel. I don't think that that qualifies as a permanent residence in the UK. So going by law, um, technically, Harry should not be a councillor of state. He doesn't have a permanent UK address that we know about. Uh, it is entirely possible that perhaps behind the scenes, quietly, the king has has given um, Harry the use of the address of Windsor Castle or Kensington Palace or Buckingham Palace, uh, perhaps as an address to give him that UK base. That information, as far as I'm aware, has not come to light. So we'll kind of park that little that idea there for a moment. Um, but if we are going by law and that hasn't happened, then Harry should not be a councillor of state. It, ha it is said that the king does not want to ruffle any feathers, antagonise Harry. I mean, how sad is that really? How bad is it that you don't want to antagonise your son for, you know, fear of retaliation? Um, that just says it all to me. It says that it's not a good space. Even, you know, all these years on, it's not a good space. And of course, the publication of Spare and the threat of another 400 pages of dissing your family um, is not 
a very palatable prospect for the king. So I don't think he does want to antagonise him. However, I don't think he has to. The law is already there in place to take care of this. All Charles has got to do is just let the, let the law play out. Harry is not a UK resident, and therefore, by the terms of the law, he should not be a councillor of state. Um, then that would put the onus on Harry to find a UK address, either buying a property, renting... I mean, it doesn't even have to be a big property. It could be a two-bedroom, small house in Windsor that he's either bought or rented. Um, he doesn't even have to stay there. He could just use it as an address. Um, and then whenever he stays, he could stay in a swanky hotel somewhere. Um, so um, the fact that he hasn't done that or that we don't know about that kind of says to me that the law should just take, you know, Charles should just allow the law to take effect and then use that as the reason to drop Harry as a councillor of state. But the law as it is, would mean that if Harry does find a UK residence, that he would be entitled to be put back as a councillor of state. I also think it's very important to note that no steps were taken during the late Queen's reign or that of King Charles to diminish Harry's status in the royal family. Somebody commented on one of my videos, I think, I don't know where people get the information from, but they said, um, you're wrong, Harry does not have the HRH. And I replied back, no, Harry most certainly does have the HRH. At the Sandringham Summit, it was agreed that Harry would not use the HRH for commercial everyday purposes. Harry so far has not done that. He's stood by the agreement but he can use it on official documents and forms in private. So we saw an actual example of that on Lilibet's birth certificate where Harry um, and Meghan used the HRH on the birth certificate. So he does still have it, um, but he's not using it for commercial everyday use. So just thought I would clear that up. But no steps have been taken to diminish his status. He is still the son of a reigning monarch. As such, he is HRH. As such, he is a prince of the United Kingdom. He is still currently, at this time, fifth in line of succession. And he is a councillor of state. So nothing has changed. Which, you know, when people have the argument, oh, well, you know, Harry's left, he's free to do what he wants. Um, you know, he's just like any other celebrity. He's not like any other celebrity. Name me a celebrity that is the son of a reigning monarch, a prince of the United Kingdom, an HRH, a royal duke, in line to the, in fifth in line to the succession and a councillor of state of the United Kingdom. You name me a celebrity that has that. Harry is fundamentally different to any other celebrity that is walking and talking and breathing in the USA. Just thought I'd make that point. And I think that's important to note because the fact that there hasn't been a will to diminish that status tells me either they don't want to antagonise him or that the king doesn't want to make the royal family into this kind of big brother popularity contest. And the same goes for Prince Andrew as well. Um, Harry and Andrew are in the same boat technically, for different reasons. I will say that for different reasons. Um, but they are in the same boat in terms of that kind of status. Um, so the king doesn't want to diminish the royal family. He doesn't want to turn it into like this kind of big brother popularity contest because that diminishes the royal family. And I think that is the real reason why nothing has been changed or altered during his reign. So I just thought that was, you know, something uh, worthy of of saying. Um, also, going back to the kind of Frogmore Cottage uh, incident, Harry at the time was paying rent on 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 it, uh, having paid back the renovation costs. He was leasing it. So really, 
There was no reason technically for him to be evicted or asked to leave other than um, perhaps it was considered being empty and they wanted to kind of restructure who was there. I still don't believe the stories that came out at the time about wanting Prince Andrew to live in um, in Frogmore Cottage in favour of uh, William and Catherine going to Royal Lodge because the king would have known that he couldn't force Andrew to do that. So even if he asked him privately and that was refused, um, Andrew was well within his right to say no because he has the lease. He bought the lease. He renovated Royal Lodge, spent, I think it was £7 million doing it up, plus the £1 million of the lease. So Andrew has definitely paid for Royal Lodge. Um, so although it may be classed and considered by many to be too big a residence for Andrew and Sarah, seeing as Beatrice and Eugenie have their own homes and lives, um, but that's irrelevant. You, you know, you can't undo Andrew's lease. So if William and Catherine do want a larger residence on the Windsor estate, there isn't much, there isn't really an option other than perhaps getting permission to build something on the estate, uh, which hasn't been done for a very long time. Uh, of course, there is the option of moving into the kind of royal wing of the main Windsor Castle, but that, of course, is reserved for the king and the queen. So I don't think uh, the Prince and Princess of Wales will be moving anywhere else anytime soon. Plus, they have so many properties um, that I, I just think that they like having a smaller house, to be quite honest although it's still probably a lot bigger than most people's. Right, I want to clear something up from uh, my previous video where, where we were talking about styles and titles regarding Princess Charlotte, because I think a comment that I made has been misconstrued um, or misinterpreted. So I want to clarify 100% what I mean by Princess Charlotte's uh, styles and titles. So if she was unmarried at the time that... Uh, her father William becomes king and therefore her brother becomes uh, the Prince of Wales, it is customary for the eldest daughter and in fact any children uh, that don't have their own title like a dukedom or an earldom in their own name to drop the of Wales for example or the of York or the of Edinburgh. Uh, it happened to the Queen. Um, so Charlotte would lose the of Wales and she would just be known as a Royal Highness the Princess Charlotte. Um, however, if she was married, then she would be Her Royal Highness the Princess Charlotte, Mrs. Whatever. Um, I do think it's very unlikely that she will be given a title in her own right. I think it's a very... See, people underestimate the Princess Royal as a title. It is the most honourable, highly regarded female royal title and style um, that you could possibly be given. It is a real privilege. So to kind of, yes, you, you're going to have to wait for it to become vacant. It is a lifetime uh, style. So it will only become available to be redistributed when Princess Anne um, is no longer with us. Um, so it could be many, many years before Princess Charlotte is known as the Princess Royal, but I don't think she's going to be given any other style or title um, other than kind of what she's got, unless she were to marry a, a member of the aristocracy that had a title. If she married a Duke, then she would be known as Her Royal Highness, Princess Charlotte, uh, Duchess of, or Countess of, whatever. So um, that is something, of course, to consider as well. Um, and I don't think there was anything else that I wanted to talk about. Ooh, there was just a little bit about Harry and Meghan, kind of, I don't, I can't even remember where, where I read it, but something about Harry and Meghan wanting to change the media. And I, I, I thought about it and I thought, well, actually, it's not the media that Harry and Meghan need to be aiming their, their weapons at, because... The media are just doing what they've always done. They've gone where the money is. Um, and the way that they decide where the money is, is by people like you and I, who are the consumers, what we want to see and we want to read. Um, so it's not 
the media that Harry and Meghan need to aim at and change, it's actually the consumer. If the consumer don't want gossip um, and don't want to see celebrities, then the media won't report it. So going back to the Invictus Games, if the consumers didn't want to see Meghan with the legs out, um, prostrating, showing, <laughs> showing her wares, um, then they wouldn't print it. So the blame, the honours is on us, you know, but the thing is, we, it's human nature. We are going to be interested in what we're interested in. So I, 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 basically what I'm trying to say is I think it's an uphill struggle and Harry and Meghan are not going to change anything. And they certainly are not going to change anything outside of the royal family. Um, it's just, it's completely futile. Anyway, I'm going to leave that video here for today. Thank you for watching. If you have enjoyed it, please give it a big old thumbs up. Don't forget to share on social media. And of course, do hit the bell so that you know whenever I upload a new video. So from me to you all and goodbye.